everyone! Today I thought I would talk to you guys about the books that I have read recently, but I am not alone. I have someone with me that I thought you guys would like saying hello to. Hi Willow! She is going to be taking a nap on my lap because this is her usual nap time, but I thought that before she falls asleep we would say hello. <laughs> okay, all right, so she is going to lay in my lap while I ramble on about books, which she is quite used to by now. I have my blanket set out so that she is all nice and cozy. Okay? I actually got this blanket for my birthday. It is from one of my best friends, Michelle, and it is an, a quote from Anna Karenina. It is the quote when Levin is talking about um, seeing Kitty and comparing her to the sun, and it's one of my one of my favorites. Back to it. Willow is nice and cozy. Even before I get started, I just want to say I'm just going to be rambling quite a lot about all the books that I have read over the past couple months. So if you want to put this on while you eat breakfast or lunch or cook dinner, if you want someone talking in the background, or if you just want to hear me blab, that's what this video is going to be. Nothing too exciting or special, just me yammering on and on. I just scared Willow. I'm sorry. The first book that I have is Sally Rooney's Beautiful World, Where Are You? I think I only referenced this book in the vlog that I just put up about creating my dream workspace where I build my new desk. So I haven't talked to you guys about this book yet, but I was so excited to read it. I love Sally Rooney. Uh, Normal People is one of my favorite contemporary novels, and I was really excited for this book. Now that some time has gone by since I've read it, my feelings for it have kind of changed. Normal People, to this day, is one of my favorite books, and I really, really love it. With this one, it's a bit different. I also like Conversations with Friends, her other novel, not as much as Normal People, so I didn't really know how I would feel about this book. I liked it, but I didn't love it, and there were some aspects of the book that when I read it, I thought, oh my gosh, that's amazing. I really liked her writing style. It was very different to her other writing styles that she has uh, used in her other two novels and her short story that I've read, Mr. Salary. I love Sally Rooney, and I loved this book for being Sally Rooney and everything that I love about her writing was in this book, but also in a different way. I just, I wasn't attached to the characters. I was interested in their stories, but I had a bit of a disconnect in terms of when I read when I read Normal People, I felt so uh, attached to the characters and I just cared for them so deeply. These characters I just didn't have much of a connection towards and I think that's kind of why I didn't love it as much. But I think that it creates an interesting dynamic because then I was asking myself, well, what are they doing that I don't like? It's just, it's a really interesting book. Um, it's about really just picking apart different dynamics and different relationships. That's what Sally Rooney does the best. So really enjoyed this. I'm definitely going to keep it on my shelves. I don't want to unhaul it or anything. Again, I do really love Sally Rooney. So just as a Sally Rooney book in general, I really loved it. And I love her writing. Then I went, <laughs> I went on an A.A. A. Milne binge. So I have been talking about this a lot on my channel recently. I am in the process of writing and illustrating my own children's story. My, it's um, a children's novel that's fully illustrated. And one of my biggest inspirations is A.A. A. Milne and his illustrator E.H. Shepard. So I, I grew up loving Winnie the Pooh. If you want to hear me ramble on and on about Winnie the Pooh, which I don't know if you actually do, I just posted a video talking about the importance of children's literature and why we should read it as adults, why it's even more important to read it as adults. And I talk about some of my favorite books, my favorite authors and illustrators. And A.A. A. Milne, Winnie the Pooh, and E.H. Shepard were all a part of that video, so if you want to hear me talk more about it, then I direct you to that video. So first I read Winnie the Pooh, and then I read The House at Pooh Corner, which this is like the first, and then the second book in the series, and then his two poetry collections, with, which actually came out before Winnie the Pooh. This one is When We Were Very Young, and this one is Now We Are Six, um, which Christopher Robin and Winnie the Pooh and Piglet and his other stuffed animal friends that inhabit the Hundred Acre Wood are also kind of part of these poems, only some of them, not all of them. And they're beautiful and charming, and so 
yes, these were returning to, to old friends, and I love them very, very dearly. These are some of my favorite books on the face of the earth. Recently, I have been doing a lot of physical reading as well as audiobook listening because I have so many projects, personal projects, and different things going on. I don't have as much time to physically read. And the audiobooks that I found for all four of these books were incredible. The narrations were amazing. They had sound effects and they had bird song and bees buzzing and music, beautiful, beautiful music. And the narrator did amazing different voices for each of the characters. I'm sorry if you can hear Willow snoring. <laughs> she's a loud sleeper um but yes so i will put pictures up of what the audiobook covers look like because i highly recommend them if you haven't ever read winnie the pooh or a.a a. milne you are never too old to read them they are even more charming as adults i think and they are just like homes away from home they are homes in pages and it's just Oh my gosh, yes. So I reread these books for like the millionth time and I had a wonderful time while I was inside of their pages. Now we have some Russian reads. The first Russian book I read is Woe from Wit by Alexander Grabodov. Grabodov? I never know how to pronounce his last name. Um, this is translated by Betsy Hulick and it is a verse comedy in four acts. I really liked this this play, so it is a play, and this is the play that inspired Pushkin to write Evgeny Onegin, his, um, his story in verse. And if you guys have been around for any amount of time, you know that Evgeny Onegin is my favorite book of 2021. Spoiler alert for my favorite books video <laughs> at the end of this year. Um, but yes, so this is a, a comedy and I really, really enjoyed it. I didn't film a reading vlog. I filmed a part, I think parts of a reading vlog. But as I was reading this book or as I was reading this play was the week or the day that we got Willow, my dog that is sleeping on my lap. <laughs> and, um, and so it kind of went down the drain, that reading vlog, because I was so... That was, that was wonderful. So I will always have the memory of getting Willow while reading Woe From Wit. And now look at how far we've come. I'm talking about the book after reading it and she is sleeping in my lap. <laughs> so this is set in Moscow's high society after the Napoleonic Wars. It has really funny characters. They're very charming. They have a great repartee and the banter that goes on in this play is amazing. We have young characters that are in love. We have young girls that are experiencing romance for the first time. We have men that are they in love with them? Are they in love with someone else? Um, we have fathers that are very protective over their daughters. We have political intrigue. We have the conversation of war and all these different elements in this story which are very common themes in Russian literature that I always love. So reading it in a different format like a play was really really interesting because it's just dialogue. You have the stage direction so that's always nice but it's taking away those descriptions that are in prose and just giving you the characters. We don't have their inner thoughts, we don't have, we don't have the meat of the story but I think in other people's opinions the meat of the story is the dialogue but in other people's opinions the meat of the story is descriptions and internal thoughts and feelings so that's always interesting to think about but i really really enjoyed this and also on the back it does say described by pushkin as the cleverest man of his generation you definitely see what pushkin likes about it it's very uh, clever and witty and I was really interested in the character's dynamics and how they behaved with one another and the different positions that people held in society and the way that high society in Moscow at that time really affected what people thought and said so very very interesting and really really enjoyed and then the next book that I read was Poor Folk by Fyodor Dostoevsky this is an epistolary novella and it's written in letters. These letters are between two people, Makar Devushkin and Varvara Alexievna. Um, they are, I believe, distant, distant relatives. He's much older than her and they are both very, very poor, living in quite poor accommodations. And it's really about um, them being there for one another and helping each other when they need help 
and talking about their positions and their lives and sort of dealing with life at this very low point in their lives. This is one of his earliest stories before he was sent into exile in Siberia, so we don't have much religious um, conversation because that was before he had these differing religious beliefs that he often wrote about, but we do see the seeds of the themes that really encapsulate his later masterpieces. And it was so interesting to think about Dostoevsky in that time. It is described on the back as Poor Folk is the author's first great literary triumph, the story of a tragic relationship with, between an impoverished copy clerk and a young seamstress told through their passionate letters to each other. And that is very true. It is a very passionate story. I want to call it a novel or a book, but it is a novella. It's so heartbreaking to see people give everything that they have for the person that they that they care for and that they love and not really being able to even support themselves but putting putting other people before them it's it's beautiful and heartbreaking and that is basically what this series of letters is it is beautifully heartbreaking and it really shows you um what it was like for the poor and um and the people of the lower class in Russian society at this time. One of my favorite parts is when Varvara is talking about one of her old experiences and it involves, I don't want to give it away, but it involves Pushkin's, Pushkin's works. And Pushkin does have a big role in Dostoevsky's life as well as in the characters in his books. So I just love the way that Dostoevsky loves Pushkin because you can tell just in the way that he makes Pushkin part of his books and his stories, so I loved that. Poor Folk is amazing. I would highly recommend you give it a read. It is very short and it is in letters, so I feel like it does flow really nicely. Then I also have another Dostoevsky, and that is The Double. So this is Notes from Underground and The Double. So I previously read Notes from Underground, did a whole reading vlog about it, one of my favorite Dostoevskys, and now I have read The Double as well, which both are in this book. I found The Double so interesting because the entire time I was asking myself, like, what is going on? Like, is this actually happening? Is the main character delusional um because you know his mental health is definitely a prominent aspect of this book anyway this is a quite nightmarish story about our main character mr guladkin who is haunted or almost possessed by his very own double this man that looks exactly like him and the whole time you are wondering yourself whether this double is real whether the original guladkin is imagining him it's not really spoken about. We do get some hints from other characters that he is really there, where I believe one of them was like setting two places for tea, so, so acknowledging that there is two people there, not just one, and it's just so interesting. It reminded me a lot of The Turn of the Screw by Henry James. You don't really know whether what the main character is telling you or seeing is actually there or if it's in their minds. And Glenkin is quite an unreliable narrator like the main character in The Turn of the Screw. Um, but what I found really, really interesting was that it's kind of left up to your own interpretation as well as The Turn of the Screw. And the whole time I was wondering like, because his mental health is quite questionable, we don't know, he, he's, he's not doing well, um, as, as most Dostoevsky characters aren't, um, but yeah, so I was always wondering, can I rely on this narrator? Is he telling the truth? Is this double really there? And, it was just a really, really interesting story to follow along with. They describe on the back, This uncertainty is what gives urgency and horror to a tale which may be read as a classic study of a human breakdown. Now, is that not Dostoevsky? <laughs> a human breakdown? That's just the definition of Dostoevsky in, in my eyes. Um, I did not annotate it, as you can see. I didn't film a reading vlog of it, obviously, as well, because recently I have been in quite a 
reading slump, reading rut, I don't really know. I think it's partially due to writing my own story, so I'm so consumed in the writing process that my reading is taking a bit of a toll, and then also having a very needy puppy who I have to make sure she doesn't, you know, rip the house apart. I've stopped annotating just because annotating does take quite a bit of time and as much as I love annotating I have been enjoying just letting myself take in a story and not really trying to over analyze it too much if you guys can hear the landscapers you know they always come to landscape my neighbor's lawns right when I am about to film or mid filming which is what's happening right now so if you hear that, I am very, very sorry. Willow has stopped snoring. So now that Willow has stopped snoring, the landscapers have started up all of their machinery. Um, so there is always some noise going on. I really hope you don't mind. Anyway, we are now on to the four books that I'm currently reading. Four books, four, four. I used to be an only one book at a time girl not anymore, clearly. <laughs> the first book that I have is for the DA Book Club. Thinking about book clubs, I just realized that I have yet to talk about Nicholas Nickleby because I don't have a physical copy, and that was the first book that I wanted to talk about, but we will save it for last now. Um, anyway, so this book is Thus For Their Faces by Sylvana Acampo, and this is a short story collection translated from the Spanish because this is a short story collection, I do have a hard time talking about it because there isn't like one specific thing that I can talk about it because it's not one f um, fluid story. It's not, it's not one plot line. It has multiple shorter stories and plot lines and conflicts and characters and there's so much in this book that I could talk about, but I think overall I really liked Sylvina Acampo's writing style. I thought that the way that she created atmosphere was beautiful. I am not completely done with this book, but I am really excited to talk about it during our live show for the DA Book Club. So if I didn't say this is for the DA Book Club, um, this was our book for October and November that Emma picked, and we will have our live show pretty soon, probably in December, on Emma's channel. So we will discuss it more then. And then the book that I am reading for the Dickens and Tolstoy debate is, of course, Resurrection by Leo Tolstoy. I am a decent way through this book, and I have the rest of November. Today is the 17th? Today's the 17th, I believe. Loving it. Um, I know that Emma, who is my co-host for the Dickens versus Tolstoy debates, is not loving it, so I'm very excited to talk about it more during our debate live show, which will be happening after the Nicholas Nickleby live show. The Nicholas Nickleby live show is happening this Friday on Emma's channel, and I'm really excited to talk about Nicholas Nickleby in this video and also for the live show and debate. Anyway, Resurrection. Oh, it's just, it's Tolstoy. It's just, oh my gosh, very different from the typical Tolstoy. So in this book, our two main characters are Prince Nekludov and Maslava. And before the novel takes place, we are introduced to them. And basically Prince Nekludov seduced and abandoned Maslava to a point where he ruined her name. He ruined um, her pretty much in terms of people viewing her in Russian society. She was ruined because of because of him and was then succumbed to become a a prostitute to just earn a living and, and make money in, in whichever way that she was able to. And for a lot of women at that time, that was prostitution because that was really the only the only way to survive. So that as a theme is huge and incredible that Tolstoy um, discusses it in it in this book, and it feels so unlike Tolstoy, this book. It, it feels like him, and I, I know that it's him, but at the same time, it feels so different and so fresh and really progressive, and the themes that are discussed are so incredibly important. Anyway, so Maslova, after, years after, she is abandoned and has become a prostitute. She is accused of murder, and when she goes to trial, 
Prince Nekludov is part of the jury. This is about Prince Nekludov trying to redeem himself, trying to basically atone for his mistakes that he um, obviously did not treat Maslova very well in the past. I really like how they put it on the back. It says, the setting of resurrection is the underworld and Tolstoy turns a highly critical eye on the law, the penal system, and above all, the church. I really like how he's shining light on the different positions that people held in society. It's not just the aristocracy in this book. We are following a lot of different people from different classes and the way that Russian society at that time has influenced where they are in their lives and the way that they are going about their futures. And this is mainly just following these two characters and also, of course, the side characters that influence them and impact them. Prince Nekludov trying to do whatever he can to make Maslova's life any better after what his doings at a young age are the cause of her ruin. It's just, it's so hard-hitting and heartfelt and Tolstoy's writing, I just can swim in it. Oh my gosh. I can't wait to discuss this book more with Emma because I know that she's not liking it. I'm really liking it, of course, because it's Tolstoy. So yes, that's Resurrection, which I'm currently reading and currently loving. I am also currently reading Spring Torrents by Ivan Turgenev. This is another wonderful, wonderful Russian read. This is set in Germany, but we are following Italian characters as well as our Russian main character. So we have this really interesting dynamic of cultures, which I'm really loving, especially because I am from Italian descent. Now, again, to prevent myself from rambling on and on and on, they put it really beautifully on the back. Returning to Russia from a tour in Italy, 23-year-old Dmitri Sanin breaks his journey at Frankfurt and for the first time falls deeply, deliriously in love. Convinced that nothing can come in the way of everlasting happiness between him and his fiancée, he impetuously decides to sell his Russian estate and start a new life, not knowing that his youthful vulnerability makes him potential prey for a darker, destructive passion. Um, the first Trigenev that I read was First Love, which I loved, and I am also really, really loving Spring Turrence. This is, again, like discussing in First Love, the, the theme of love, the theme of passion, the theme of first loves, and how that really influences people's uh, actions and the way that they interact with one another, with all the characters, and the decisions that they make, like this main character, Sanin, makes this huge decision to sell all of his land and his estate and um, I am at this particular part in the story where it's really taking a turn and I kind of can see where this is leading and it is leading in a more dark destructive direction in terms of something that I think he's going to do but I'm not really sure if he's actually going to go that way but I'm really loving it. Ivan Turgenev is amazing. The way that he writes is just like every other Russian writer, incredible, but also very unique. I'm really loving the characters. There is our one of our main characters, Gemma, who is Italian, and she is described as having dark curls, and so I feel like a, a connection with her because I have, you know, dark curls and I am also Italian. And her mother's name is Leonora, and my mother's name is also Leonora. So I just find that really funny. So I'm, ha I'm having quite quite the connection with Gemma and also just the story in general, I think is beautiful. And I really love Turgenev. So I loved First Love. I'm loving Spring Turrence. I think that this is the start of a beautiful friendship between me and Turgenev. The last book that I'm currently reading, and then I will talk to you guys about Nicholas Nickleby, is this beautiful, beautiful book that my cousin Michelle got me for my birthday. This is The Art of Winnie the Pooh, How Each Shepherd Illustrated an Icon. This is written by James Campbell with the forward by Minette Shepherd, which is um, E.H. Shepherd's granddaughter. And it also has a keepsake art print inside, which I haven't actually looked at yet. But yeah, I haven't opened it yet. Look at that beautiful map of the Hundred Acre Wood. And then we also have the print is in here, which I haven't opened yet. But anyway, this is a beautiful, beautiful book full of gorgeous illustrations by E.H. Shepard. And it's basically the story of, it also has photographs, early sketches from E.H. Shepard's life. 
This is about E.H. Shepard and his life, how he became the illustrator of Winnie the Pooh. There's a picture of A.A. A. Milne and Christopher Robin. This is Shepard Studio at Shamley Green, Surrey. And then this is also a self-portrait of Shepard in his officer's uniform. So something that really influenced A.A. A. Milne and E.H. Shepard was um, the First World War because they both fought, I believe, at the Battle of Somme and in France and they had um, a lot of PTSD, which was a big reason of why they wanted to write Winnie the Pooh is because they felt like after so much sorrow, Winnie the Pooh and the story of the characters in the Hundred Acre Wood could bring people joy and happiness after a time that there really was no joy and happiness. And that is exactly what it did. I am so incredibly inspired by Winnie the Pooh to see like some it also says like some sketches are never before seen and these are all from the archives and it is just so fascinating to see the sketches like for instance right here so we have a sketch and then the final so the sketch is on top and then the final illustrations on the bottle the bottom so just seeing the way that his his work evolved like here the door is opened but he decided to close it here we have like rocks in the sketch but there are no rocks in the final so it's just it's like getting a hidden glimpse into a into a secret corridor that we weren't supposed to have access to it's like this book is kind of like a key uh into looking into the thought process that E.H. Shepard went through and had and it's just wonderful to read about and to look through. We of course have like some rig original sketches and illustrations so I have been loving this book um, so much. I just started it the other day and I know that I'm going to refer back to it very very fr frequently because he is such an inspiration for me. So many great books. Now I want to briefly talk about Nicholas Nickleby and then I will save all of my thoughts for the debate that is happening on Friday. I'll put a picture up of the cover right here. I don't have my physical copy with me. I watched Emma's reading vlog of Nicholas Nickleby and she gave it three, three and a half stars, I think. And I gave it four. And I'm supposed to be team Tolstoy. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I liked it more than Emma. Oh my goodness. I can't believe it. Um, I I really loved Nicholas Nickleby. Did I see that coming? No. Um, another reason why I didn't film for a vlog of Nicholas Nickleby was again, I was in quite of a slump and I think it was also me just trying to figure out life. It was all in a time where my brain was a little like woohoo all over the place. So yes, I didn't film a vlog for Nicholas Nickleby, but now I kind of regret it because I wish that I had. And so that is more inspiration for me to and more incentive for me to film reading vlogs even when I feel a little overwhelmed. <laughs> That's pretty much why I didn't film for Nicholas Nickleby. I was just a little overwhelmed with uh, with life after university figuring out jobs but now it's all figured out so we're all good not to ramble. Um, I loved Nicholas Nickleby so much. There's so much to say that I feel like I, I don't have enough time to talk about everything that I want to talk about, but I loved it. Dickens is amazing. Oh my gosh. I feel like with the Dickens and Tolstoy debate, I have been so pro Tolstoy because I am like Tolstoy's number one fan, but I love Dickens so, so, so much and I feel like I just need to reiterate that because I do feel like sometimes I am so pro Tolstoy because of the the Dickens versus Tolstoy debate I do have to give my love to Dickens at times. Great Expectations is one of my favorite books ever 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 um just up there with Anna Karenina and so many amazing books. Reading Nicholas Nickleby was kind of like the first reminder of oh my gosh this is the dickens that i love this is what i love about great expectations and christmas carol and his other later books and and this is why i love dickens and this is why we're doing the debate um because it's so interesting to see this evolution of writers and to to compare them and to think about well what do we like from one person what do we like from another and how their differences affect our reading experiences and how we appreciate the stories and take in the stories. But yes, Nicholas Nickleby, I do think a lot of people do still have some issues with it, which 
I'm sure Emmett and I will of course be discussing in the debate, something that is getting better about Dickens that I saw in Nicholas Nickleby was his writing of female characters. But for Dickens, I do feel like there is a great improvement. I loved not only getting Nicholas's storyline, but also his sister Kate. Some of my other favorite characters were the side characters. Smike is my favorite character of the whole book. I love Smike. I want to protect him with every fiber of my being. As well as Newman Noggs. I loved Newman Noggs. And they're just... Reading Nicholas Nickleby reminded me of why I love Dickens' characters so much. And even though they're caricatures, they're so charming and they're so great. And, they're, and you just can't help but fall in love with them. They're so particular and... Um, and eccentric but in the best ways and he just makes the mundane magical he makes everything magical and I just love Dickens do you see Dickens I'm sorry that I have kind of you know I have uh, put put you in the shadow of Tolstoy but I'm I'm loving you I'm loving you now um <laughs> and so I feel like that's what's going to be so interesting about the debate series is because from now on we are going to be reading more and more of Dickens's great masterpieces. Anyway, so these two writers that I care about so deeply and try to compare them? Like, what did I get myself into? <laughs> An impossible thing to do to compare them, but a very interesting thing to do and something that Emma and I love doing. So yes, I can't wait for the D Nicholas Nickleby debate because I have so much to say. We're gonna do our best I love Tolstoy so much, I love Dickens so much, and I can't wait to discuss them more and more, and I can't believe that we have been doing the Dickens versus Tolstoy debate for almost an entire year, and then we're gonna go on to year two. Oh my gosh, I can't, I can't wait. So anyway, Willow is um kind of waking up from her nap now. Hello, Willow. Are you? <laughs> She's still very sleepy. Do you want to say goodbye to everyone? She's like, Mom, I'm still sleeping. <laughs> anyway, I hope you guys have enjoyed this very rambly recent reads catch up. Um, I am apologize for not keeping you updated with like reading vlogs or anything. Just recently I have been a bit overwhelmed just with life in general, but things are really settling down. I just have to find a nice balance between my work and my leisure activities like reading and filming, which I love doing very, very much, and I love combining all of my joys. So anyway, look at that face. Look at that face. Um, Willow and I hope you are having a wonderful day wherever you are, and you're reading some amazing books, and you are enjoying the colder weather, and are having a very wonderful day. So we will see you soon in another video. <laughs> Happy reading.